the, the objectives, I'm not going to spend a lot of time reading those to you. What I want to do, even though a number of you are emergency planners, is to talk directly to our pharmacists. But with that in mind, I ask all of you that are involved, whether it's with EMA, whether it's with public health or whatever type of organization, to take this information with you. In addition to that, we should have some time at the end for questions. I know there were some left over during Nancy's presentation. Maybe my background um, in disaster management coupled with pharmacy can help answer some of those questions as far as staffing, number of personnel. But we really want to talk about what we can do to minimize the impact of a disaster on your pharmacy. Those of you that are with EMA realize that we look at things from our point of view, from strate strategic planning, a little bit differently. And those of my pharmacist friends out there are already worried that I'm going to pick on them, and I will, so if they're not by C, already know where you're sitting. But I like to start with basics. When we talk about a disaster, everyone in emergency preparedness knows what that is. But to start from a basic level, it's a sudden calamitous event that's going to cause incredible damage, loss, and destruction. Oftentimes, we'll talk about, oh my gosh, I've had a disaster in my pharmacy, the refrigerator went down, oh my gosh, a uh, somebody yelled at me in the pharmacy. If I'm doing pharmacy work and haven't been yelled at in the parking lot on the way to unlock the pharmacy, it's probably going to be a sign that I may have a good day. But from that basic concept, I want to focus our mind on something that's beyond what we consider the typical bad day. And it'll take me just a second to get used to the electronics here. I didn't know I had a monitor in the front. Everyone here without that logo at the top would know what that's a photo of. This is, this is just a, a distant snapshot of what New Orleans looked like after Katrina. I don't know the exact number of pharmacies that were there, but we're looking at the difference between a disaster of this magnitude, where if you have a pharmacy or had a pharmacy at that time, totally non-functional. Something that from a natural disaster to a total man-made disaster. In 2015, riots where our fellow citizens burned a city. And I didn't do the photo, I didn't do the the cut and clip, but if you were watching the news during that period of time, you'll remember footage of a, I believe it was a CVS store that was totally gutted and destroyed. So it wasn't a weather event, it wasn't an earthquake, it wasn't some combination of those. This is a man-made event. I still, many years later, have trouble looking at this photo. Many of you do too. But imagine being in the area of the Twin Towers. We look, those of us in the South, we, we live, even if those of us in town, we don't live in high-rise complexes like folks in New York and the bigger cities do. There were pharmacies in the general area of the Twin Towers. The dust and debris from the towers, even though their facility may not have been destroyed, may as well have been destroyed for all practical purposes. It was, the facilities were rendered totally useless. And do I need to tell anybody about this? Probably every emergency planner in the group remembers this photo, this distant photo with Bryant-Denny Stadium and, and literally the mother of all tornadoes coming up at it. Now, thinking about things, everything from the Katrina type of event that's an all-hands-on-deck situation, to 9-11, to all-hands-on-deck, let's look at your particular pharmacy. And those of you, again, I'm asking those of you that are not in a pharmacy setting to please take some of this back to your area so that we can talk about how to better prepare them in the event of a disaster. Think your pharmacy setting right now. And I'm going to ask you this a couple of times. Right now, whether you're in an institutional setting or whether you're in a community pharmacy, if today was the flood, if today was the superstorm, or if today was the day 
the riots hit your community and your store was rendered non, you can't go in it, what things would you want to change? What things would you want to have in place, whether you're dealing with personnel, your patients, the facility itself, and when I say that, I mean the structure, your records, and then what would you want to do as far as how am I prepared to take care of my community? Because if my facility has been destroyed, is there a good chance that there's been a problem in your neighborhood that far exceeds any damage that exists to your community? And, and I've crammed a lot of info into these slides. I know that may be a little hard to, to comprehend, but I believe we're going to have those available on the public health website shortly. Think, of, think this is what I need to get you doing, and that is thinking. What would you do during the next hurricane? And I've given just a couple of big ones. We don't even have to give you the exact date of the April 27th tornadoes for you to remember the supercell that went through the state on that day high winds, earthquakes. When I say earthquakes, I'm, I'm just going to pick on the pharmacy folks here. Who thinks that Alabama is in potential danger for being hit with an earthquake? All right, good. And, and I may pronounce this wrong, but uh, we've been taught through the National Disaster Medical System, we pronounce it the New Madrid Fault. Some people still call it the New Madrid Fault. But the New Madrid Fault if, it, if it, that occurs, it's going to be more deadly than what is anticipated on the West Coast. So when you think, what do I need to do to get ready, think of the fact that, yes, an earthquake could happen here, even though most of us think that our biggest challenge is going to be with a tornado and the every five to 20 year hurricane. And those of you in north, in central to north Alabama kind of go, eh, that's just a coastal problem. It's way more than a coastal problem. And then the other events that we have listed here, riots. And that covers a, a, a lot of things because people go crazy. And I'm going to use a, let me just put out a disclaimer here. The Department of Public Health is, is not going to approve of any off-color off statement that I, made, and I make, neither is the Board of Pharmacy or McWhorter School of Pharmacy. Several of you have heard me joke over the past two days that you can't fix stupid. You can, those of us in pharmacy realize you can medicate it, but you can't, you can't fix it. And our EMA partners need to know that. So in law enforcement, you, you can't fix it, but you can treat it. It's not just the riot. Several months ago in Birmingham, Alabama, at a pediatric dental clinic in, in the Fairfield Inslee, just a little suburb outside of Birmingham, a car drives through the center, the glass, the glass front of a pediatric clinic, killing a little boy. We saw on the news a few days ago where a, whether the individual was under the influence of alcohol, drugs, or a combination of both, does a U-turn, mows down individuals on a street. Things happen. Within the past few days, we've had bombings. So things in our world are different than they were 20 years ago. Don't think these things can't happen to me. And one of the things that I think that Scott and Eddie from the Board of Pharmacy are going to talk about is to be sure and mention the barricades that can be put up in front of a facility to prevent that bad guy or that crazy guy from drunk running through the front of the pharmacy. While it's my hope and desire that you never have to encounter this, I would rather you be prepared and it not happen than for you not to be prepared and it happen. So what would you do if today your, your facility is under three feet of water? Can you operate it? We all know the answer to that is no, but what would you do? What would you do if a lightning strike just took out the power to your facility? Something simple like that. A small flood, and if you're the victim of a flood, there's no such thing as a small flood. To us in preparedness, there's a difference in that. But what would you do? Violence in the neighborhood. We have to be prepared. There's a wealth of incredible information available on a multitude of websites, the National Disaster Medical System, huge amount of information on the Alabama Department of Public Health. But I want you all to focus right now, and I hope that my 
emergency management partners would echo this. Before you can help your neighbor, before you can get that pharmacy up and operational, you have to first be able to take care of yourself and take care of your family. One of the basic tenets that we have before our medical team gets out the door is we have to take care of ourselves before we can treat other patients. I don't want to wind up taking another victim to a disaster. Think about that. If, some, if someone you know is on my medical team and they're sick and they go to a deployment with me, instead of bringing an emergency preparedness personnel, I've just brought the first victim to the scene. So your thought needs to be, what can I do for me? You heard that in safety and security yesterday. What can I do for my family? And those of us that, that don't have kids, remember, we think our pets are our children. Yes, I'm that person. I'm, I'm that person. Yes, my dog has a pink collar. Guess what? You know, her, she's got all this fancy gear, but she's her mom's baby. I need you to think about building a kit. What are you going to do if you're out of power for a week? Can you capture your records? Have your records been saved if it was destroyed? Do you have a list of all the patients that are your special needs patients? In other words, if you have service a long-term care facility, do you have access to a list where you can get that list to another pharmacy and say, I need you to take care of these patients while, while my pharmacy is incapacitated? Do you have patients that are homebound, individuals that have to have medication? The advantage of a disaster that we know is coming, the Katrina event, and, and I'm the person that's going to tell you that I wasn't surprised there was damage when Katrina hit. We have the technology now, and when I'm watching the news and there is a, a storm that's literally the size of the Gulf of Mexico, I'm not going to tell you everything's going to be okay. There's going to be a problem. We were fortunate en enough to have days warnings of the superstorm, the, the cell that hit and destroyed the state of Alabama. Many situations are not like that. So if you have a heads up, can you get extra medication to those long-term care facilities? Can you get medication to your homebound patients? The emergency plan. New language for my pharmacy friends, except those of you that are in administration. It's going to have to be unique for what your facility does. In other words, if you're a general community pharmacy, your plan is going to be different than the closed pharmacy that just services long-term care patients. Or if you're the long-term care facility, it has to be tailor-made towards what you actually do. A lot of facilities in their business plans, the difference between the chains and the independents is they have somebody in corporate that's actually taking care of this business continuity plan for them. The average person that's operating out of the small independent pharmacy or the five, six privately owned chain pharmacy only hears about the continuity of operations if they've made time to talk with an estate planner. And I'm going to throw a plug out, and, and, and this is where people hate lawyers. I'm not trying to get business for me. I'm trying to take care of you. If you, haven't, if you own a business and haven't talked to an attorney about a continuity of business plan, if something happens to you, you're already, you're already behind. Make arrangements to do that. If you want somebody to have your stuff when you pass on, talk to an attorney, or at least get a will kit. I mean, they're, they're available at Staples. Uh, find an attorney and get that done. It, it's, you don't want state law determining who gets your property in the event of your death or dis disability. You're going to see here in a moment that fed, the federal model for preparation is a little different than the model that you and I are going to use in dealing with our pharmacies. And there's a reason for that. We'll look at both of them real quickly. The main difference, as you can see, is with the FEMA plan on your left, there's a big square for mitigation. That's also with our state partners on, the, on any level, whether it's the Department of Public Health or whether it's uh, the state EMA. In other words, they know that there's going to be damage in our state when the event happens, whatever that event is. 
And so a huge part of their plan is mitigating the impact of what that damage is. Then you can see it's a constant cycle. It's preparing for that. It's responding. It's recovery and going, hey, something's going to happen down the road. A good example of what is mitigation for those of you that are not used to this term, if you'll think about flood areas where the state will come in or the county will come in or some government entity says, hey, this is a low-lying area, we need to keep this or minimize the impact of a flood. They're mitigating potential damage that's happening down the road. This cycle is designed to prepare us in the event something happens and we know something's going to happen, but yet keep us in a constant cycle of preparation. Another thing that we talk about, and several folks have addressed the fact that you need an emergency plan. I tend to think that even though that emergency plan is necessary, what's more important to me than the plan is the fact that you are planning. If you have a plan and continue to do either tabletop exercises, drills, or a combination of those, the art of planning will help you find holes in that plan and allow you to improve down the road in the event something does happen. Now remember with the pharmacies, I'm saying in the event something does happen. In my world and in the world of many of you out here, we know something is going to happen. The question is when and the question is where. So what are we gonna do with your personnel, your patients, the facility, the records, and the community? So when you talk personnel, right now on your electronic device, does your cell phone have the name and contact information for all of your full-time and part-time employees? You don't have to raise your hand, but if there's the thought that's like, holy crap, we've got three new employees, then your answer is no. Meaning, what happens if you're in a flood zone and can't get out, but there's a relief pharmacist that could go open up, how are you going to get, in, get them in the store? You've got to have a list. You need to make sure that list is current and up to date. Anybody here in a pharmacy that does not have help, in other words, that doesn't have a tech? Let me just tell you something. Techs are awesome people. We can't operate a pharmacy without them, but could you invest a couple of hours in overtime for them to allow them to create the list, take the burden off of you, or allow them to update your phone so that when something happens or if there's a disaster, you can at least try to call if the phones are up and check on them. Same thing with the list for the high-risk patients, whether they're your patients or whether they're patients that are, that are permanent residents of a long-term care facility homebound patients or patients that are partially homebound in that maybe some days they feel good and can get in but other days that they can't. And don't forget your regular patient population. Right now, if you needed to reconstruct it, could you reconstruct your patient profiles from your backup? Have you checked to see if your backup actually works? I get, I get called to pharmacy situations under this kind of scenario. It could be, uh, hey, 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 Ron, I, I need you here now. There's never, hey, it, it's Tim, or hey, this is Sam. It's like, hey, can you get over here now? And I'm like, let's slow down for a second. I'm, uh, tell me your name again, kind of thing. And a computer crash, is that devastating to your building, to your facility? Oh, my gosh. You should walk into a computer crash. We use all of our sailor terms and all kinds of stuff like that. Your facility, please tell me it's insured, even if you're renting. And if it's not, I need some people to start making some mental notes. Can the facility get da damaged enough that it damages your inventory? Obviously, the answer is yes. Could it damage your computer system? You can get renter's insurance. If you don't have insurance on your facility, before you get in your car to drive home tomorrow, make a call to an insurance agent. I'm not here advocating one company over another, but I want you guys to have errors and omissions insurance, but in particular, I also want you to have facilities insurance. 
And, and, and Jim, I'm going to pick on you for a second. If you think I'm starting to talk too fast, I'm used to talking to my pharmacy folks, and they know that I kind of go at one speed, which is really fast. Signal me, and I will slow down. Get insurance. It's, it's a wise investment. Um, fixtures. Right now, if you had to replace your computer system, how much would that cost? I had a quote, uh, a client had a quote on a software program called RX30 that was approximately $50,000 a week ago to replace their computer and their software system. Now, I don't know about y'all, but uh, I probably have like seven bucks in my pocket, and I don't have an extra 50 grand laying around. So you've got to be thinking like that. If I have insurance on just the facility, what am I going to do if everything in there is totally demolished? We have anyone here from the Tuscaloosa area or North Alabama? There are no words to explain how bad the tornadoes were that went through there. In retrospect, how many people would, would give almost everything they have right now if they could have had a storm shelter in their facility? Something as simple, I say simple because hindsight is perfect. This can be added to a structure that exists either on the inside of the facility or on the outside of the facility. Just like when, I think it was Jim that was talking this morning about when he walked in, he was counting the steps from his in, the entrance he went into the building at to the first exit that he saw. That's kind of how I look when I go into a, a friend's pharmacy. In other words, I've gone in here, what can I do to help them mitigate a problem that hasn't happened yet? So storm shelter, safe room, safe room not only for storms, but a safe room for bad guys, not to put bad guys in. I have colleagues over here that have special rooms that they can put bad guys in, friends over here with special rooms they can put them in. I mean, is there a room in or a designated area you could convert to a room in that facility to be a safe room from a storm, but also a safe room from a bad guy with a gun, <coughs> excuse me, or a bad guy with a knife? Bad guy, and when I say bad guy, it could be bad girl, bad guy, just a bad human. For your records, now I grew up in a hunting household. I have a gun safe at my home, but could you add a gun safe to your facility to store records? Could you have it to store the backup of your records? And I don't mean the kind of little gun safe that somebody can, you know, some big honking guy can walk in there and pick it up. I'm talking the kind that can't be carried away and better yet, the kind that is bolted to a concrete floor. You can store valuables there. A lot of people are getting them now to store their controlled substances, but I'm concerned, can you store your records there to reconstruct your business in the event of that disaster? Generators. Best investment my husband and I have made has been a whole house generator. Neighbors thought I was crazy. Within 14 days of having this generator installed, I live in a neighborhood where for no reason the power goes off. Apparently, if the birds take diuretics, the power is going to go off at the Lacey household. Little liquid on the lines is going out. I not only had all the lights on, man, I got, I mean, I got the lights on. I'm calling people like, hey, it's really too cold in the house down here. How y'all doing? They hate me. But best investment we have made has to get, is to get a generator. But think business-wise, do I need a generator? That's got to be your call. And everything I'm talking about has a cost associated with it. It could be a cost in terms of effort, or it could be a cost in terms of money. Now, having backup records, does that cost you any money? Probably not. It's probably already available in your software system. Does a generator cost money? Absolutely. But the question is, how long are you willing to be without power? And if you're without power, you're not operating your business. What is the cost of your doing business? You can get small, medium, large. You can get generators that will run this facility. We have generators that run major hospitals. You don't need one that that's, big, that's that big, but just think about it. 
I know you sell flashlights in your pharmacy, but do you have one that you can use? Do you have one that, if you have one that you can use, does it have batteries in it that are operational? Who has a car? Everybody's got a car. Go to Academy and get one of those little tiny lights to put on your keychain so that you can at least see safely to get out the door. Do you have your own first aid kit? Medications, you're like, well, Ron, I like Ron a drugstore. Well, yeah, you do, but you still kind of need a prescription for some of these things, right? I mean, I'm, I've, got, I've got certain people over here watching me, not to name names, but uh, you still need medications. Have those in advance. And without question, food and water. Uh, I mean, my neighbor, I've got one neighbor that thinks you should, you know, while everybody else is getting milk and bread, I'm like getting chocolate milk and I'm getting Oreo cookies, stuff like that. You get important stuff, he's getting beer. I mean, if you're going to be, I mean, it's, it's about priorities. I, I think it's going to be a short disaster, so how, how much trouble can I get into drinking chocolate milk for three days? I don't know. On your cell phone. Now, remember, if I say on your cell phone, some type of electronic device that is secured. Not that anybody can pick it up and access it, but something that's secured. You get, the, you get the call in the middle of the night. Lightning has struck your pharmacy. There's been a riot. Whatever the call is, can you contact that insurance agent? Or was everything dealing with that policy inside the store? If it's in that, inside the store, it's not going to be very useful to you. Do you know what it covers? Can you get continuity of business insurance? In other words, it's kind of like disability insurance for those of you that are, that are employed by a major company. In other words, if you can't work, can you still be guaranteed some income? Have a sit down with your agent if you have one. If you don't have one, find an agent, have a sit down with them, and at least every other year, review that policy to make sure your coverage is adequate. What do I mean by that? Those of you that don't sell a lot of biologicals, you don't worry about the cost of that. But what if the structure and format of your practice changes? And all of a sudden now, I am the local go-to source for the drug thalidomide, which costs between twenty dollars and $30,000 for 30 tablets. Difference in my normal expensive inventory, plus I've added that to it. Patient records, again, can you get them? Do you have separate lists? Do you have a tech that you can designate, and I say designate, trust to do it, number one, but two, to allow them extra hours to do it? Notice I'm saying extra hours. If you think you're busy, I'm here to tell you your tech believes that they're busier than you are. They're not going to tell you that. They're just going to give you this look when you go, hey, I'm too busy to do this. Will you do this before you get home this afternoon? They're like, uh, dude, I'm as busy as you are. Make extra time, have overlap where that tech can do that without them feeling that they're pressed. Again, store this on an electronic device. You can store it in the safe. Remember, you've already bought a safe in this scenario. You've bolted it to the ground. I actually have a fire resistance safe just because it's kind of like that's how we roll. What? You know, I've got a fire resistance safe. You've got the fire extinguisher in the car. You've got the knife in your pocket. You've got the knife strapped to your leg. All this kind of stuff. You've got the Cubaton over here. It's like I'm ready, except I hope I don't, I don't do the squirrel thing when the panic time comes. Does your software vendor offer a backup service? They probably do. Most of us have no idea what our software will actually do. Could you get in touch with the vendor right now that, say if you have RX30, and something goes, and, and the store just doesn't exist anymore. Do you know how to contact RX30? Do you have any idea what your vendor number is with them? Oh my goodness, who operates in here without the use of third party insurance? Could you contact Blue Cross tomorrow if your life depended on it, if you didn't have that cheat sheet that was taped up right there beside the computer? You've dialed that number a thousand times, but do you know what it is? Do you know what those ID numbers are? I'm thinking maybe you would want to let your tech have an entire day of overlap 
to try to help gather this data and have a method of storing it. If you store it at home, and I'm just talking about your third party information right now, do you want that just on the laptop that the kids have got access to or would you want that maintained in a secure location? I want everything maintained in a secure location. Your internet service. Remember, if there's a disaster, and I think I forgot to tell you about banking, you guys, especially you young little whippersnappers out there, you don't even know what a check is. I'm probably one of the few people in the room that still knows what a check is. And, and I'm here to tell you, especially law enforcement friends, guys out here, if I am ever kidnapped by the cartel and told to make methamphetamine and they carry me to the little ATM machine, I'm dead. I'm dead. I don't have a PIN number. I don't have one of those little stick the card in and feeds out money things. And I don't know how to make methamphetamine. I've got a degree. I'm going to have to get on YouTube. So when they find my body laying on the side of the road, go, you can put on my tombstone. She really didn't know how to make that. Because I, I don't. But, but keep that in front. It's sad. I, I just decided one day I had too much information. I couldn't keep another code in my head. I just can't. I, I don't care if it's a simple number. Can't do it. Uh, but anyhow, I'll, I'll attempt to get more realistic here and get, get back to the point. I actually believe in the KISS theory. And as an, a part-time employee at a private school, I'm not supposed to say keep it simple stupid because, oh, oh my gosh, that's an offensive word. So I've had to come up with keep it super simple, right? We, we want to keep this plan simple because if it's complex, you're not only not going to do it, if you ever get it done, you're not going to update it. So I want you to keep whatever it is simple. I'm suggesting, and you don't have to scream it out loud, can you afford to hire, have two techs on duty for one shift? Yeah, I know you don't need it. Yeah, 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 you don't know how much it costs. And I got that FICA or FICA insurance I got to pay. Do it. Just do it. Make sure it's an overlap where the individual you bring in, or if you can con your spouse into this, I guarantee you it's going to be cheaper to pay the tech than to con your spouse into doing this for you. <laughs> it, just trust me on this. So, like, baby, let me get you to do me a favor. It's going to cost you a lot more money. Have them make first the contact list of your employees. One of my biggest uh, panics, and on the April 27th tornadoes, our home was hit by the morning tornado that hit Cahaba Heights. And, and, every, and I'm not going to get up here and go, hey, it sounded like a train. Uh, <coughs> I, had, I had this plan because, you know, as planners, we're a little anal retentive. We knew approximately when those storms were going to, that supercell was going to hit the state of Alabama. So what? I'm a thinker. I'm going to get up early. I'm going to be at Sanford University by 6.30 in the morning. I'm going to do whatever it is that I need to do. So I am, and, and I'm going to leave campus by 12, going to stop by the store and get me some chocolate milk and cookies, and I'm going to sit back and watch the storms. This is, this is my plan. And it's just one of those, and if you've been doing this long enough, something didn't seem right. Some, something in the weather didn't feel right. So I go, it's, it's not from here to the back wall, from our bedroom to the front of the house. I turn the TV on, and there's Jerry Tracy. Those of you in Birmingham know you got trouble if Jerry Tracy's on that early in the morning. He's like, well, we got a little weather hit, hitting Bessemer, and about this time it sounds like softballs are hitting the glass in our home. And my husband swears that I can levitate people. This, this, I, mean, it, it's, I mean, picture Jackie Traina from University of Alabama. As hard as she could throw a softball, it's like hundreds and hundreds of them hitting on the side of our house. I go, I grab my husband's shoulder, and this is the conversation. He swears he's being held up like, like this. And it, the conversation was, get up, get the dog, get in the basement. Now, what, what would a typical husband do if you did that at 5, 5.30 in the morning? 
No, a smart husband would have done that. My husband goes, what's that sound hitting the glass on the back here? And so it, his shoulder will be all right. It's, it's going to be okay. It's, it's, just a, it's, just, it's not a crime in a, heat of, in a heat of passion like that. And so here I am cursing my husband trying to, as I'm trying to save his life. Ironic. <laughs> And we didn't have we didn't have time to make it to the base. We made it to the basement door. So disasters can happen. And I'm here today because God allowed me to be here today. A tree that I can't reach, could not then physically reach around, was the width of my hand this way away from our bedroom. They were unable to count the number of trees. We're fortunate enough to live on the Cahaba in uh, Birmingham. Could not count the number of trees that were down. And we, we supposedly live in the city. So I'm not here because of anything that Rhonda has done. God spared my life that day, and hopefully I've made, I have and will continue to maybe do some good things to make sure he goes, well, maybe I should have moved that tree over a little bit. <laughs> but... Um, I hope that's not how y'all feel when, you, when we end here today. Hire that tech for that extra shift. Make these lists. Because my biggest fear after I realized that, you know, we're, we're okay, and there's that moment when there's that sudden quiet during the tornado, and my husband reluctantly is talking to me because now he's got a permanent injury, he goes, are we okay now? And my comment was, we're either okay or we're about to die. Because, and it happens just that quick. So have, my fear was, was I going to be able, could I get in touch with my neighbor? We couldn't get out of our yard. Is my family okay? And this is before the storms hit. The big storms that moment of not knowing. And of course, we had no set, our landlines aren't working because we don't have lines that are up in our neighborhood. Cell phone wasn't working. I live in a hole. I live down, down on the Cahaba, I'm under the 459 Cahaba River Bridge. On a good day, I have to kind of scoot up the side of the, inter you, you don't know that. I don't want you to know where I live, right? You didn't hear that. <laughs> But it's, it's just a situation where being able to contact them. My medical team partnered from Mobile, Alabama 3. When Randy Smith from Alabama 3 heard that there had been a morning storm, he went ahead and started organizing his group. And his comment was, we got to make sure Ron's OK. They were waiting to get federalized. They weren't federalized. They were begging to be activated so they could come help us. They couldn't reach us by phone. So those moments, if something happens, you want to be, if there's a means of communication, you want to be able to reach your pharmacist and your technicians and go, hey, are you okay? What can I do? And if there's this huge, if, if they can't get out of their driveway and you can, you're like, hey, that's no problem. I'll be over there and help you. What do you need? Neighbor had, at, at the time, babies. And I'm like, oh my gosh, if we almost had this tree through our house, what about Mike and Melissa? What about Charlie Grace and Camden? We need to be able, if we take care of ourselves, and, and I'm not sure my husband's ever forgiven me for that. He's never said anything. But I think he secretly harbors a grudge during storms. <laughs> can, we, can we take care of ourselves? Can I then take care of my neighbor? The first thing that we did was try to crawl through debris and go check on those babies. Because if their parents weren't OK, we didn't want an infant and a three-year-old wandering around by themselves. So if you'll take care of your store, first if you'll take care of you and your family. I knew that we had water. I knew that my pets were going to have food. We have, this, we have rules at the Lacey household. In other words, if you open a bag of dog food and there's not another bag there, the rule is you've got to get another one. There's always going, we're, we have it built into our lifestyles that we don't think about it. I always have two cases of water. 
In other words, if you pop into one and, and we, we drink it, even though we have tap water, to make sure we have fresh bottled water there. We're not going to starve. Good grief, I probably could be put on an island. I'm not going to be put on that naked and afraid island. I said naked, not naked. <laughs> That's not happening. I could be put on an island with my clothes and probably need to lose some weight, but none of this naked and afraid stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm going to need, need my clothes. I could go to a couple of days without food. I don't want to, but there are some people that can't do that. There are a lot of people that are scraping by and can barely get by today. So if you take care of you and your family and pets, we can take care of our neighbor in need. Whether it's a neighbor that really can't take care of themselves or if it's the neighbor that you wonder how they get out of bed and get to work the next morning. I mean, we, have, we, have, we all have friends or family or somebody that you just think, well, bless their heart. How do they even get their shoes on? I mean, I don't know. We'll have people, you know, you'll, you'll go into a disaster and you're like, well, I don't have any water. And Katrina, I, I don't have, Katrina, there are no words to describe Katrina, Haiti, or any of these other events that I've been to. But for crying out loud, my sister-in-law, who at the time was living on Ono Island, if you guys don't know where that is, that says I got too much money and bought a real expensive house on the water. It's what Ono Island is. <laughs> Calls me during Ivan, and I, we tried to get her to evacuate. My, my brother-in-law has passed away, and I'm like, come be with us. She's in the bathtub, and she goes, Ron, the walls are moving. And, and I don't have any water. And in my head, I'm like, well, you fixing to. <laughs> you Jackson do. I did not say that. But but I can't fix that kind of stupid. Educated woman. Seriously, I mean you can't and I know if I hear stupid, y'all hear stupid. And in my head I'm like, you probably should write your driver's license number in a Sharpie on your leg. <laughs> We're going to need to be able to reconstruct, we're going to be able to piece you together. Some things we can't fix, but when she told me she didn't have water, I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? You're the Martha Stewart of our family. You've got a pot. Put some water in it. Well, I didn't think it was really going to hit. Well, there's a big picture on the news sitting in the golf right outside your island. I digressed. I'm sorry. I was supposed to. I'm just sorry. I hope y'all learned something. A, a medical personnel have a dark sense of humor any, anyhow. Law enforcement, everybody in here has got a dark sense of humor. One of the things that, that we did before we landed on, on Haiti is that aside from putting our blood type on, on a, one leg and opposing arm, was we put our driver's license number in Sharpie so that if, if the contingency happened, we're civilized people, in the event a contingency happened, someone could identify our remains and get us home. That's how I think. I don't want you to think that dark, but I do want you to think right now, can I my wife or my husband, my kids, my cat, my dog, my gerbil, my whatever you got that's alive in your house, can we make it three to five days on the supplies that we have? Not what you would want, but do you have your medication? And especially if, you, if you're crazy, I want you to have your medication. That was a joke and nobody got that. <laughs> they, they got that. I mean, you know, it's like if you need, if you need your nerve pills. People need nerve pills sometimes to put up with me. But right now, if you can't do that for your household, you're not going to be able to take care of your business. Wonderful information on the Department of Public Health website. I want you to use this KISS theory. It doesn't have to be complex. Guys, y'all eat stuff that women don't like a lot. My husband, I started buying jerky for my dog, and my husband eats it. I'm, <laughs> I think that's rude, but they sit in there and like they're watching TV like, hey, want some jerky biscuit? She, so if, if you guys can live off jerky and cold beanie weenies, more power to you. 
I'm going to have Ritz crackers and peanut butter. You don't have to have filet. Have something, but make sure you have water. And if you're like me, we, we live in a, in a home that defies the rules of plumbing. There's one rule, and there are actually three rules of plumbing, and they all relate to rule number one. Stuff flows downhill. We live on the Cahaba River. We have to have a pump that pushes it uphill so it'll flow back down again. I can't, I, you can't even make this up. So at the Lacey household, for years we have had to have a generator because let me tell you something, y'all were talking about sometimes people are not happy and um, the, uh, marsh, the marshal that was here said, you know, after a few days in Katrina you're not happy. Well, you weren't, but a few days at the Lacey household without being able to use the toilet and flush it or take a shower, and, and I'm too old now to go in the woods. <laughs> My knees don't work the way they used to. I need, I mean, we have to have a generator to operate a pump on our septic system. So if you've got something squirrely at your house that you've got to do, I don't know, maybe your dog's on a CPAP machine. Well, do whatever it is, make sure somebody knows how to do that. Can a family member right now say you're incapacitated? And just imagine, my... The people that deal with me every day have to deal with this. Y'all just had to deal with me one day at that table, and y'all are ready to run out screaming. Can a trusted family member or colleague have access to your contact list? Can they? Some of you work with people, you're like, mm, I don't even want them to know where I live. <laughs> yeah, I live, I, I live at the Y. I live there. <laughs> Make sure somebody knows how to get in touch with that because if you're all bungled up, all banged up, if you're dealing with the Andrews group and you've got cat, you've seen the commercial where you got casts in every direction, you're not going to be able to go to the pharmacy, but can somebody contact your employees and make sure they know how to do that? Get those critical lists done. Set up appointments with these facilities, especially those of you that service long-term care facilities set up a contingency plan. In other words, they're going to think you're crazy, and I get that. Go, I just want to make sure that you know I've hired Bubba's Pharmacy down the street to cover for me in the event something happens. Doesn't need to be the pharmacy next door. They need to be on the other side of, of where you are. They need to be miles and miles away. If you got hit by a tornado, do you think if they're across the street that they may have gotten hit by the tornado too? If your facility got flooded, think they may have gotten flooded too. So think like that. Have one of us come by and you're like, well, you're not on the list. You, you're crazy. Have one of us come by and talk with you about what could help make your facility less disaster prone or help you set up an emergency plan. Make, and, and I want to show you these things. You're like, I don't have any space in my pharmacy. And I know that's a picture of a house, but that can easily be put behind a commercial pharmacy, a storm shelter. And on the, on the other side, on the right side, if you're in the process of building a facility, a safe room, this room can serve as a safe room for storms, can also serve to minimize the impact or hopefully divert the impact of a projectile coming through it. Those of you that are around firearms realize that certain projectiles can get through that. But as the marshal told us yesterday, you've got some goofy people out there. They're like, hmm, concrete wall, can't shoot them. I'm like, yay me. If you have a storm shelter, this is a big hello call. Pharmacists are hoarders. I don't know if other people here know that or not. We have to keep records for exorbitant lengths of time. So we think if we're told we have to keep them for two years, there must have been a zero at the end of that. <laughs> we're going to keep it for at least 20 years. And there are records. You try to go in a bathroom in a pharmacy, and you've got to be a ninja to get through. If you have one of these facilities, it has a purpose. It is not to store old prescription records in. It is not to, it's not to put the information that you used to study with at Auburn or Sanford University. It is a safe room. If you can't get in it, you can't use it. How much warning do you usually get on a tornado? Seven minutes. 
Now, if this thing is chocked full of, of records and chaos, oh, we have our Christmas decorations back there too. Well, good for you. I want to be about the Thanksgiving turkey and the Christmas decorations. Are you going to be able to empty that out in seven minutes and take care of the people in the store? I just need you to think through these things. The, you're going to notice that these doors, and I don't know if this makes any difference, some of these doors slide, but most of them are going to open towards the inside. Because if the facility is destroyed, and if you're in a neck, and there's stuff on the outside of the door, can you push it open? Probably not. So, I, I, again, I'm not getting any kickbacks from these people. I, I wish I was. Now let's talk about your building. That's kind of cute, isn't it? That's for tailgating. That's not for survival. Again, this is wonderful as my backup generator for the septic pump. It, it'll run that. It will also, it's also powerful enough to ignite the electronic ignition on our, our tankless water heater. Uh, but you're not going to run your pharmacy with that. You're just going to make yourself mad. You're going to also irritate your patients because when you go, hey, we're going to be great, we've got this generator, are you going to be able to run your, your whole business with this generator? I don't think so. This is way more useful but I don't know about you guys, Whew, we've got air conditioning in here. I love me some AC. When do we get most of the, the hurricane problems? Is it usually kind of cool? Oh no, it's going to be hotter than Dixie, right? And those of us from mid-Alabama to northern Alabama are going to have spin-off tornadoes as a result of that. If we have damage because of tornadoes, and the southern part of the state has had major damage as a result of a hurricane, where is the power company going to go first? To the biggest source of damage. You may be out proportionately longer than the folks on the Gulf Coast. I love having air conditioning. We all get a little ill and irritated when we're not in our normal comfort zone, whether it's we're too cold or we're too hot. People will start hurting each other when they're too hot. Our, I think my police officer friends will verify that in major cities, as the temperature goes up, crime goes up. I don't, I don't like me crime. I like me some air conditioning. I want people to be happy and not yelling at Ron. And then my favorite friend, the mothers of all generators. Yeah, the one that you're, you don't even have to do anything. These can be programmed that at a certain time every day, they're going to cut off the power to your business, and they're going to run for a certain length of time. I had the occasion to talk with an institutional facility several months ago, and the topic of generators came up. And I may, in a passing conversation, I go, uh, how often do you, do you run your generator? And I get the deer in the headlight look. What do you mean? Our power hadn't gone off. And I'm like, you mean you don't test the generator to see if it's going to work? If you have a generator and it hasn't been tested this quarter or in the past six months, I'll be so bold as to say the past, and with this individual, it was the past 20 years. Anyone want to bet whether or not that puppy would have cranked or not? It's not going to happen. Why have it if it's not, if it's not going to work? So just, just think about that. Records. This is a port this is a handheld external hard drive. Every record that your facility has can be placed on one of those. I don't want it placed on that and put in a pocket. Remember, I'm encouraging a fireproof vault that is secured to the floor. HIPAA applies. Every DE agent I have ever talked with regarding emergency preparedness is very quick to remind me that just because there's a disaster, that doesn't waive federal law. Now, in Alabama, we're going to have certain laws that are suspended pursuant to the governor's order. But with HIPAA, you, you think HHS is going to be okay if you just drop, left that at a Waffle House one day? Probably not. I know if my records were on there, I wouldn't. So you think, think. You can do this. Have those backup records. 
Now, this is a mysterious thing to me. I know conceptually that a cloud is not really a cloud. There's some mysterious hard drive, and it, it could be in imaginary Bubba's basement somewhere. He could have the cloud. But you can back your data up to an encrypted, secure cloud. And if the price seems too good to be true, it's probably not encrypted, and it's probably not secure. Where at your fingertips from another computer or at a temporary location, all of us have seen situations where people have brought portable trailers in, set it up in the location where their pharmacy used to be. They get a computer system. They know the vendor. They have that software installed, order more drugs, and bingo. They, they're taking care of the community. So I don't know. I can't explain the cloud. The gentleman that I'm looking at, the gentleman in the back of the room probably understand it. But to me, it's a magic place where records go. I don't, I don't know. And I wouldn't know my password to it either. So don't kidnap me. <coughs> you guys that, that work in pharmacies, don't accept this or maybe just don't recognize it. Historically, you're classified as one of the most trusted and trustworthy professions every year. Nursing is too. And we don't even need to talk about where lawyers rank there, but let's just say they're never really in a list. If you turn the list upside down, you can find us. But with that, they trust you. And as Nancy and Jim and every other speaker have talked about, we can become a valuable resource for the community. A resource where they, they trust that they can come to you and talk with you. Where the patient says, oh my goodness, I've been without power for a week. Or my medication's going to be okay for me to take. You told me they were temperature sensitive. Can you partner with the Alabama Department of Public Health? and become a useful tool to them. Are there things you can do? I need you to be willing to use your position in the community after you've taken care of yourself and your family to do this. But in order to do it, you've got to take care of your facility. And, let, uh, and hang on, let me, who knows their local police department? The police officers. Boy, where are my pharmacy people? You, You've got to know who your local folks are. Not just for, hey, you know, hey, we go to church together, but in the event of an emergency, it's all hands on deck. It, are, is police going to be involved? Absolutely. Emergency management, local Red Cross, medical reserve corps. Uh, a lot of pharmacists here may or may not know what that is, but that is a group of individuals that are organized, that are able to help provide services during times of disaster. If you're not already signed up with the Alabama Department of Public Health to serve as one of their volunteers, set, take time to, it's not going to take five minutes to sign up to be a volunteer. And Nancy, I don't know how long y'all have been maintaining that list. Do those of us that are, are on there, do we need to update any information or just check and make sure that we're still on that list? I would check um, the list that I got this week. Um, a lot of people had dropped off. Okay. So periodically, they not be signed up and Okay. So may, what if every pharmacist that was here today made it a mission that within the next seven days we check that you haven't signed up, sign up. If your name doesn't show up, just re-sign up. That's a way that Nancy and the Alabama Department of Public Health can contact us. If you're the store owner or district manager, can you take the time and incentivize your techs to sign up to do that? Again, resources for us. Churches community ac action groups. You hear a lot of emergency personnel talk about the CERT team. Know that it's a community emergency response team. All you have to do is go to the local EMA website and they will tell you if there are CERT classes that are being offered in the area. Maybe you know what a fire extinguisher looks like but you've never used one. Take a CERT class. Maybe you don't know how to safety, safely lift a patient if somebody's been injured. 
Take a CERT class. They'll teach you how to do that. Most pharmacists, I'm, I'm going to venture to say, are certified in CPR. If you've allowed that certification to lapse, please go get that re-upped. Become certified by, through the Red Cross with their first aid program. And again, become CERT certified. Little things. Think, think about it. If, if there was another, if there was Katrina II in the Gulf, whether you're a pharmacy director of a big hospital, pharmacy director of a small hospital, or you're living and working in a small independent pharmacy, if you knew we had the next Katrina sitting in the Gulf, what extra supplies could you go ahead and order now to have on hand, not only for you and your family, but for the community? In other words, first aid supplies. Think about the medications, the special medications that those populations are going to need that you already have lists of. Can they take care of their basic needs? Can you go ahead and get overrides from Blue Cross to fill medications early to have those available? Can you reach out to the Alabama Department of Public Health and say, is there anything we need to do in this community for this population? If you just think April the 27th and look back, especially those of us that were hit by that storm, what would you want that you didn't have? What would you like to have in your facility? And hey, remember, you're gener you've got a generator now. Could you serve as a cooling station? A lot of times storms happen during, during the really hotter months. Could there be a community information source there, have a TV where people could drop by? Could you aid another pharmacy? If your pharmacy's not damaged, could you, could you and would you? When I say would you, I think most of you would if you thought about it. If you have three pharmacists and y'all rotate shifts, could you, by being a good neighbor, go, hey, Ron, why don't you go over to Tim's pharmacy? Tim's home got destroyed. You, you just run the store for him. I'll take care of your salary. Little things like that. Or if you have, or if your tech, whoever has been injured, reassign an employee to a shelter, reassign an employee to a community area where, where water or medical supplies are being given out. A lot of you have delivery drivers. Bring in an extra tech to help cover, to help cover things. Reassign the delivery driver if you can postpone deliveries. A lot of things you can do. You can be powerful. You can be impactful. And, and hang on, I think the next, I'm giving you some references, but this is where I want to take time and try to clear up some, what may have been some confusion earlier. I want you to start now and start small. The KISS theory, keep, keep it simple. Can you just get in the habit of making sure that, you, that there's a, a case of water at your home? That's not hard. Everybody's been to Walmart, right? I mean, go some, order it through your vendor. Start small. But I'm here to tell you, one of the most valuable things you can do for yourself is to designate, if you, if you want to do it, do it. I think you're too busy to do it. Designate an employee to make those valuable lists for you so that if something happens, you're going to be okay. I, I want to make sure that everyone here, especially my emergency preparedness friends, realize that when that next event happens, and you can probably tell I'm a little older than some of the people here in the group. I mean, well, I know we had one visitor who said they didn't have hair. I'm fortunate to have hair, and it's gray. I'd rather have, you know, gray hair than not still be in the program. I have yet to see a disaster when the governor has not suspended some of our laws. Please, please understand that I don't think personnel are going to be an issue as far as, or as big of an issue, I'm trying, and I'm going to keep Nancy here as my shout out, I don't think that's going to be as big of an issue as some folks think, because if the governor suspends the dispensing law, we have a wealth of personnel that can help. And Nancy and I are both going to be at the Alabama Pharmacy Association Convention in June. I know that you're going to have a table there. 
I will be doing a presentation and will be happy to put in a, a section, Nancy, if you want, either at the beginning or the end, dealing with how to volunteer to help the Alabama Department of Public Health. But if I could get each of you right now to share that with your fellow pharmacists, to share that with your technicians, and especially other pharmacists, whether you work with them or see them at church, see them at a community group, because I know that pharmacy is going to step up in the event of a need, but I also realize that the biggest thing you hear is what maybe somebody didn't do. Because bad news travels a lot faster and a lot quicker than good news does. I, I know that when I got the call from the Alabama Department of Public Health, my medical team had already been activated. I asked our director in D.C. if I could detour to, buy, to Mobile and Bayou Labatry before I headed to New Orleans and Plaquemines Parish. So there are going to be things that can be done. Be that asset. My contact information will be on the slides that I think you guys are posting. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And God bless you.